Now we bring you Evan J. Peterson with our writing workshop on creating monsters. They are sitting in a plain beige room with fantasy art on the wall and are wearing glasses. Thank you, Evan. Hello, and welcome to Making Monsters. I'm Evan J. Peterson, author, game writer, and monsterologist, coming to you in a transmission from my secret laboratory hidden somewhere in Seattle. I'm here to teach you a thing or two about creating monsters for fiction, for art, and for gaming. This presentation is meant for all audiences, so it will be suitable for kids while also presenting some advanced concepts for adults. Take what you like from this workshop. The point is to get inspired and gain some knowledge. I am not the last word on monsters. I'm just your friendly neighborhood monsterologist. If you have questions during or after this session, feel free to tweet them to me at Evan J. Peterson. That's all one word, one string of characters, or you can email them via my website. All right, so why do I study and create monsters? Well, because I love them. Monsters are awesome. Uh, I've loved monsters since I was a kid, watching my VHS tapes of killer clowns from outer space and Little Shop of Horrors over and over until the video wore out. So, do you know the difference between a monster and a villain? Are monsters always evil? Let's answer the second question first, because I am sinister like that. Monsters are not, by definition, evil. Think of all the monsters out there who are scary, but are not very cruel. There's Shrek. There's Beast himself from Beauty and the Beast. And many versions of the Frankenstein monster show him as someone very sensitive and mostly well-meaning. Not every version. Even superheroes like many of the X-Men are frightening to the people in their world, but the X-Men are usually the good guys working for tolerance and peace. So you may have guessed, all monsters are not evil, but all monsters are scary. All monsters cause fear, but the person who experiences the fear could be good, evil, neutral, or just terribly misguided. Spider-Man is a monster to J. Jonah Jameson. Storm and Wolverine are monsters to people like General Stryker and other people who hate mutants. Hermione Granger and Harry Potter are considered monstrous by anyone who thinks that magic and witchcraft are always evil. The best part about telling a monster story is figuring out who's the scary one, who gets scared, and then what happens as a result. So that's where we start. A monster causes fear, and that fear has to be part of the monster's story, whether the monster is our hero, our villain, or a scary animal like the T-Rex in Jurassic Park. And now for a pro tip. All inspiration is good inspiration. Mimicking others is how you evolve from amateur to original. If you're a beginning writer and artist, don't be afraid to copy someone else's style right now. 
Copying others is how kids learn to be people, and it's how creative people learn their craft. So now that I've been talking for a good four minutes, uh, let's do a writing prompt. Or an art prompt, if you prefer that. Take five to ten minutes and make a list of things that scare you or other people. Your choice. Then take another ten minutes and create a monster based on this fear. You can draw it, you can write a description, tell a story, or create it any way you want to. All right, go ahead and pause the video while you do this exercise. Back already? <laughs> Where does the time go? Now let's discuss some mindful monster creation practices. Monsters are usually mysterious with unknown abilities and unknown goals. In fact, it's that fear of the unknown, a very common human fear, that has led to monster stories being found throughout human history and in every human culture. Everybody has monsters, no matter where on the planet they grew up, where their ancestors come from, every culture has monsters. I encourage you to read about monsters from around the world. That's how you become a master monsterologist. And think about what kinds of fears are being presented, or represented rather, by each kind of monster. Monsters, whether they're our friends or our enemies, are always examples of otherness. Monsters are different from the rest of us. They are the others. They're different in how they look or how they act or what they can do. Past writers such as H.P. Lovecraft made their careers out of a fear of immigrants, foreigners, and other outsiders. When Lovecraft writes about the disaster of people intermarrying and having children with the fish kingdom from under the sea, he was actually expressing his opinion that white people should not marry people who aren't white. He was saying that mixing races is monstrous. And we now know that Lovecraft was wrong. And he's remembered as much for his racism as he is for his memorable stories. So I encourage all of my students, protégés, mentees, and padawans to make their own minds up about do you want to follow a certain artist's work, even if you think the artist themselves is 
wrong or bad. Wrong and bad. <sighs> such complicated terms in such in such plain language. So reductive. Okay. Depending on your audience, you can take an anything goes approach to monsters. However, I do want to warn you about the effect of using otherness to scare people. So here are some tips for reducing human prejudice in your monster stories. Tip number one, don't make the monsters insane. We have 200 years of mental illness in monster stories, and it's finally wearing out. Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde may look like a metaphor for multiple personalities, but I think we've used up any creativity left in making a monster crazy. Remember, most people with a mental illness are a much bigger danger to themselves than they are to anyone else, and they experience a lot of discrimination around the world. Tip number two. Don't make the monster a person who is disfigured or deformed. Now, for thousands of years, monsters have been associated with physical ugliness, disfigurement, and even physical disabilities. In fact, the word monster comes from the Latin term for uh, demonstration. And what was being demonstrated was that parents, either human parents or animal parents, had done something really wrong to offend the gods and spirits, and that's why their children were born disfigured. Yeah, this is the ableist history of monsters. These are good things to know. So look at someone like Quasimodo, who is the hunchback of Notre Dame, or even someone like Freddy Krueger, who was badly burned in a fire. There are many ways to make your monsters look scary without making them look like people, human beings, with a disability or scars. Tip number three. Throughout history, monsters have often been based on hatred and distrust between groups of human beings. From the Rakshasa of India to King Kong, sometimes the monsters are a little too familiar and they can increase prejudice between groups. So try not to base your monster on a group of people or a culture. Think about who this monster looks like and their history. Do they have face markings and jewelry that's unfamiliar to you, but common in other places and other cultures? Are the monsters basically just indigenous aliens, natives that don't want to be colonized? You my brilliant creative ones, can do better than that. So these three tips, they're not just to save you from getting canceled on social media. It's way more than that. These guidelines also redirect your creativity so that you can invent monsters that aren't the same old tired stereotypes. Putting limits and boundaries around your creativity actually pushes you to be more creative rather than less. This is a common misunderstanding. We're not just reducing discrimination and prejudice here. We are doing that, hopefully, but we're also challenging ourselves to be more creative than those who came before us. Try this instead. Look to biology. Animals, plants, Fungus and other living things are way weirder than most of us could imagine by ourselves. Scary insects and animals have inspired countless stories and films. So many monsters are chimeras. The original chimera is a monster from ancient Greece with a lion's body and head, plus an extra goat head and a whole snake as a tail. Don't ask me, ask the Greeks. Nowadays, the word chimera can have several meanings, but for this lesson, let's stick with this one. Chimera. Noun. A mythical animal with parts taken from various animals. So what's your favorite chimera? Is it the chimera ants 
from Hunter x Hunter? Is it Long, the Chinese dragon with a camel's head, a snake's neck, an eagle's claws, and a deer's antlers? Well, why stop there? Chimeras are made of parts of different animals, by definition, but why not take bits from plants? Does the Frankenstein monster count as a chimera, since all his parts come from different people, but they're all human? Or so we think. Mm. I have opinions. Is a werewolf a chimera if it's sometimes human, sometimes a wolf, but never in between? I like to keep these questions unanswered because it's more fun that way. Monsters, by their very nature, disrupt categories. Monsters are difficult to categorize. Are they people or are they animals? Are they alive or are they dead? Are they good or are they evil? Are they this or are they that? One of my favorite things about monsters is that they shake all that up, okay? They make it difficult to put them in a tidy little category. So, for the next exercise, draw or write a description of a monster you create that has parts taken from various sources, animal or not. Take five to ten minutes for this, and then pause the video. I'll wait. Okay, did you make an awesome, scary chimera? Did you make a friendly, silly chimera? It's all good. For the final exercise, I want you to take one of the monsters you've created during this session and write a paragraph or more from this monster's point of view. Don't worry if you made a monster that doesn't talk. The, it, just imagine what the monster thinks about. What are this monster's feelings? What is this monster afraid of? What does this monster want? Go ahead and pause the video while you write in the monster's perspective. All right, my little budding monsterologists, I hope this presentation has set you on the road to becoming a full-on, professional, educated monsterologist. Anyone can be one. It just requires knowledge. Once again, I am Evan J. Peterson. You can find me on Twitter, at Evan J. Peterson. You can also find my website, www evanjpeterson.com 
I also teach a variety of writing classes online. Uh, so check my website and contact me if you'd like to get involved. Now go out there, read about monsters, watch monster movies and cartoons, read monster comics, and make the world a weirder place for everyone. Evan J. Peterson, Monsterologist, signing off.